Hi everyone, it's Miss Flanagan. I thought today we might take a little break from fiction and we're gonna do a book called Flight, which is a story of Charles Lindbergh's first transatlantic flight. So for those of you who like true stories and biographical information, this book might be for you. So here we go. It is 1927, and his name is Charles Lindbergh. Later, they will call him the Lone Eagle. Later, they will call him Lucky Lindy, but not now. Now it is May 20th, 1927, and he is standing in the still dark dawn. He watches rain drizzle down on the airfield and on his small airplane. The airplane has a name painted on its side, Spirit of St. Louis. So here he is standing, and here is his plane. Lindbergh is nearly as tall as the plane itself, and yet he is about to attempt what no one has done before, to fly without a stop from New York to Paris, France. Over 3,600 miles away, across the Atlantic Ocean, alone. He climbs into the box-like cockpit that will be his only home for many, many hours. He clicks on the engine. He listens as it catches, gurgles, and roars. A few friends are here to say goodbye. They are only a few feet away, and yet to Lindbergh, how far off they seem. They look up at him and wave, good luck, keep safe. And so here he is getting ready to leave and to go on his adventure and his friends are wishing him well. A telephone wire stretches across the far end of the field. To touch this wire will plunge the plane to the ground. There's an extra fuel tank in front of the cockpit. Because of this, Lindbergh cannot see straight ahead. Will the spirit of St. Louis with its 5,000 pounds rise into the air? To keep the plane lighter, Lindbergh is leaving behind his radio and parachute. Will that be enough? He has been up all night getting ready. A thought runs back and forth through his mind. Is it still possible to turn back, to return home? And yet another thought is stronger. I have been waiting my entire life for this flight. Lindbergh lowers his goggles and nods his head. Go! Men on each side push to help the plane roll over the soggy ground. The little plane bumps forward, gaining speed. The wheels leave the ground, then touch back. The plane seems to hop, taking its last bow to earth. On the third try, it stays aloft. It soars above the wire by only 20 feet. The spirit of St. Louis rises in the air. It is 7.52 in the morning, New York time. Lindbergh points his plane toward the Atlantic and beyond, toward Paris, over 30 hours away. Okay, so here he is when he's taking off. And here is a friend waving goodbye. He gazes down in the morning light. How far off Paris seems, across the long ocean. He plans to follow the coastline, flying northeast. The land's edge looks to him like green fingers pointing at the dark sea. To see ahead, Lindbergh pokes a small homemade periscope out the side of the cockpit. Sometimes he flies very close to the water, just 10 feet above the waves. He knows that at this low height, the plane glides more smoothly. The plane drones on. It cruises at about 100 miles an hour. At this rate, he will have enough fuel to reach his destination but only if he stays on course. Beside him in the cockpit is a little book. He keeps a diary as he goes, all day long, hour by hour. It is as if he were speaking to himself. He wants to remember everything because no one else will ever really know. At 12.08, he flies above Nova Scotia. Just after four o'clock, he flies above the coast of Newfoundland. At dusk, he looks down and sees icebergs. In his diary, he calls them white pyramids, white patches on a blackened sea, centuries of the Arctic. He wonders what lies ahead. So here he is at the cockpit.
The sun sets far beyond, behind the plain. Lindbergh flies over St. John's, Newfoundland, the last point of land in North America. Now he can no longer follow the land's edge for direction. He must chart his course carefully. The slightest movement could send him miles off course and risk his fuel supply. He follows two compasses and the stars to navigate. As long as the sky is clear, he is safe, but he must stay awake. He writes, now I must cross not one, but two oceans, one of night and one of water. Time passes slowly. It is almost nine o'clock at night, Lindbergh's 13th hour in the air. He has completed one third of the flight. Okay, so here's his plane. He moves through dense curling fog, lit ghostly white by the moon. He suddenly enters a huge storm cloud. The plane shimmers, moving up and down in the uniform blackness. He wonders, can I fly above it? Slowly he soars to 10,500 feet. Here it is clear, but very, very cold. He extends his arm outside the cockpit and feels stinging pinpricks. He clicks on his small flashlight and peers out. Heavy ice has formed on the plane's wings. He cannot risk his instruments icing up. He points his plane back down. The wings quiver as they slice through the turbulent air. The fog continues, but now at least the air is warmer. The ice begins to melt and Lindbergh roars ahead through the fog and clouds to Paris, over 2,000 miles away. Okay, so here he is when his plane is kind of starting to ice up and he's a little bit worried. Space and time and deep, deep darkness. It is the other side of midnight, the loneliest hours. Lindbergh has been awake for almost 50 hours straight. He is closer to Europe than America. Now there is no turning back, only moving forward. He dozes for a minute and then jerks awake. One of the plane's wings is dipping crazily. In a sudden rush of fear, he grabs for the throttle. He gropes for the steady center with his heart pounding. As he feels the leveling wings, he lets out a breath. He repeats over and over to himself, I must not sleep, I must not sleep. Here, high above the churning ocean, to sleep is to die. There are some of the things he does to stay awake. He leans his face near the open window to feel the cold air. He holds his eyelids up with his fingers to keep them from closing. He remembers growing up on a farm in Minnesota. He remembers being a trick pilot and walking out on a plane's wings. He remembers the people in St. Louis who paid for this plane. Sometimes he takes a sip of water from his canteen. He also has five chicken sandwiches with him. That is all the food he has brought but he eats nothing. It is easier to stay awake on an empty stomach. His body cries for sleep. He loses track of time. The night seems endless. He wishes for the sun to rise. Okay, so here he is taking a drink from his canteen. And here is the night sky. Dawn comes slowly, growing out of the gray mist. Will the fog never end, he wonders? The clouds change color from green to gray and from gray to red and gold. Lindbergh has been in the air for 23 hours. He is 2,300 miles from New York and has 1,300 miles to go. He feels completely alone in the world. He feels as if he were flying through all eternity. He tries to stay on course, but because of his constantly curving route, he is not always sure. Here and there, the clouds seem to break apart. He sees, far below him, the ocean. From high up, it is like a great blue shaft with gray walls. Then he flies into the clouds again, into the unchanging mist. Okay, so now at least it's kind of turning into daytime for him. But he's pretty tired. The day comes on, brighter and warmer. Sometimes he imagines he sees land. No, it is only the flickering shapes of the clouds and water, 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 endless water. It is 7.30 in the morning in New York and Paris is over a thousand miles away. 
There's no alternative but death and failure, he writes. Flying closer to the water, Lindbergh sights a porpoise leaping above the waves. Then he spies a seagull, then fishing boats. Something quickens in Lindbergh's blood. He guides his plane carefully down and down to just above a boat. He throttles the plane and calls out a question. Which way, he shouts, is Ireland? He hopes for a word. He longs for a wave, a warmer welcome back to the fellowship of men. It is 10.52 in the morning, New York time. Okay, so here he is flying, and here he, here's the man that he's kind of shouting to and asking if he's near Ireland. Lindbergh sees in the distance low mountains. Now he is awake with new hope. Land is near. He quickly unfolds a map across his knees. He flies over the southern tip of Ireland. He is right on course. Cows graze on green hills. People in horse-drawn carts look up and wave. He could land in Ireland, but decides to go on. He wants to complete his dream. Okay, so here he is, checking out his map, realizing that he's crossing Ireland right now. It is 1.52 in the afternoon, New York time, as he crosses England. It is Lindbergh's 31st hour in the air. He crosses more water. The wide day is slowly ebbing toward twilight. When he sees land, the coast of France, children run out of their houses and watch him fly by. He continues on. Then Lindbergh spies a glow ahead of him. Paris, I am here, I am here. A great joy wells up inside him. For a moment, he does not want the flight ever to end. Huddled inside his tiny box house, folded in the dense hum of the airplane's engine. He loves the strange closeness to the clouds and sky. It is 4.52 in the afternoon, New York time, Lindbergh's 34th hour in the air. Okay, so here he is kind of getting to Paris and he has been in the air for more than a day. From above, all Lindbergh sees are many, many small lights. But now he must concentrate on just one thing. The sod coming up to meet me, closer, closer, closer. The plane touches the ground. It bounces, rolls, hugs the solid earth. It is 10.22 Paris time. The flight has taken 33 and a half hours. Okay, so here he is arriving. People are waving. It has been quite, quite a long journey for him. Thousands of people are running toward the plane. For a moment, Lindbergh is dazed. It seems to him as if he were drowning in a great sea. People surround the plane, cheering, but Lindbergh can hardly hear them. His ears seem to have become deafened by the hours of roaring engines. Crowds pull him out of the cockpit. Men and women are calling his name over and over. They carry him on their shoulders. Others begin to tear pieces of the plane. More than anything else, Lindbergh wants to save the spirit of St. Louis. His first words are a question. Are there any mechanics here? But no one speaks English. Finally, two French aviators arrive to help him. Policemen guard the plane. The aviators take Lindbergh away from the still cheering crowd. So here he is being held on top of shoulders of people. And people are kind of taking parts of the plane to have something like a souvenir of the event, but he wants to save his plane. In the airfield's hangar, he tells the story of his flight to the other pilots. The cramped cockpit, the aloneness, the long, long night. Meanwhile, unknown to Lindbergh, newspaper headlines all over the world are beginning to blazon the news. American hero, safe in Paris. Lindbergh is driven off to the American Embassy. He answers more questions about his flight. He has not slept in over 60 hours. Finally, at 4.15 in the morning, he goes to bed. Okay, so here he is answering questions for people. And different reporters and different people are taking notes. 
when he wakes, his life will be changed forever. When he wakes, there will be huge parades and medals and speeches. He will be the most famous man in the entire world. It is the year 1927. It is 1927 and his name is Charles Lindbergh. Okay, so that is the story of Charles Lindbergh's first transatlantic flight in 1927. I hope you enjoyed this story and hopefully soon we'll be able to go on planes and take trips and visit wonderful places too. But until then, take care and have fun with your family. See you soon. Bye-bye.